Hi everybody, welcome back. Today I want to have a look at the SCN2674. It's a video display controller from the mid 80s, a bit like the 6845 that I've seen used before in the BBC Micro and in early PC graphics cards. Somebody on the Benita Reddit pointed it out back in December and I thought it looked interesting so I got hold of one to experiment with. They don't seem to be widely available, but it looks like you can still get them from eBay, at least here in the UK, and from AliExpress. This one's from eBay. Um, you can see it's packaged pretty well there, which is a bit hit and miss on eBay sometimes, but you know it's got it's got the proper foam backing. Seems to have some anti-static bag as well around it, and a nice hand-drawn label saying SCN2674. Let's start by looking at the datasheet though, to see what it is and what it can do. So the specific question about this on the forum was really whether it's suitable for VGA. And I had some doubts because a lot of the chips of this era um, are only really suitable for the kind of lower frequencies of standard definition TV. But this one looked pretty promising, so, so I thought I'd give it a go. So quoting from the opening paragraph here, it says the ABDC generates the vertical and horizontal timing signals necessary for the display of interlaced or non-interlaced data on a CRT monitor and it provides consecutive addressing to a user specified display buffer memory uh, sorry to a user specified display buffer memory domain and controls the CPU display buffer interface for various buffer configuration modes so that sounds a lot like what a 6845 provides except that extra bit about controlling the CPU display buffer interface which is not something that the 6845 can do for you also note that it explicitly states that the display memory domain is user specified. Um, so this device doesn't include its own video memory, nor does it directly drive the display. Uh, the main outputs we're going to get from it are vertical and horizontal sync pulses. So all of the it does all the kind of timing of everything, um, and the addresses that scan through the video memory um, over the course of the frame. And it's going to be up to us to provide the video memory itself uh, to read data out of it and to convert that into red, green and blue outputs for the display. They then go on to discuss the general composition of a CRT terminal system. I guess this is something that maybe they sold. I, I, think, I think there are a whole bunch of chips here that they did actually um, provide custom chips for um, that were designed to kind of plug together. Um, but in, in particular they're calling out the need for a character generator IC, uh, a colour attribute controller, some display RAM and of course a CPU. So that would be, that would be for a text terminal. Um, I'm more interested in graphics here though, so I'll be mostly looking at how we can do that. Over here then are the headline features, and we can see that it supports uh, 2.7 MHz and 4 MHz operation, uh, depending on which variant you get. I think I have the 4 MHz version, based on the number that's printed on the, on the, on the chip. And it says it can output uh, up to 256 characters per row. A character in a text-based system would be, as you expect, an ASCII character. Um, in a graphic system it's not quite that simple. And it can do 16 raster lines per character row and 128 character rows per frame. So like the 6845, it's a character-based system optimised for text output rather than graphics. So let's have a look at how that would typically be used in a text-based system first and then move on to looking at how we can use it for graphics. So Generally, in a 640x480 text mode, you'd have 80 characters per row and something like 30 rows per frame with 16 scan lines per character. And if each character is then 8 uh, pixels wide, then that would give you the whole 640x480 resolution. And the video display controller would output a sequence of 80 memory addresses over the course of each scan line. And it would then repeat the same uh, 80 memory addresses for the next 15 scan lines, which are all part of the same kind of row of characters on the screen. Uh, because we want to read the same ASCII codes uh, 16 times essentially for that. Uh, they then get fed to a character generator ROM um, along with a row index which uh, and that then causes different pixels to get displayed on the uh, different rows of each character. And after it's done all 16 scan lines of one character row, uh, for the next scan line it will advance to the next sequence of 80 memory addresses for, to, so that it can display the next row of characters. So at a very basic level, to get graphics output, we could consider each character to be a whole pixel. And according to these specs, we would then get um, potentially up to 256 pixels across the display. And we could configure the chip to output, for example, 120 character rows with four scan lines per row uh, to get our vertical resolution of 480 out of that. 
However, we need to pay attention to the maximum character rate, which, uh, which is this 4 megahertz at the top here. So the pixel clock for 640 by 480 VGA is actually around 25 megahertz. So if we wanted to get 640 pixels across the screen, we'd need to be uh, clocking it at, at 25 megahertz, which is obviously way out of spec here. The fastest character clock we could provide that divides uh, 25 megahertz cleanly but isn't greater than 4 megahertz is about 3 megahertz, it's like 3.1 megahertz or something like that, uh, which would correspond to 8 VGA pixels. And for, co for comparison, that is half of the character clock that, rate that I'm currently using in my own VGA circuit. Um, and when I say character clock there, I mean the rate at which I'm actually reading from RAM. So that means we're still stuck with a maximum of 80 pixels per row if we consider uh, one character to be one pixel. To get a higher resolution horizontally, we would need to add our own circuit uh, to output multiple pixels per character clock, uh, which is very much like what I did already in my VGA circuits. Um, and it's usually done using shift registers or latches, uh, but of course it adds a lot of complexity. So we'll deal with that in more detail later on, but first I want to just get it hooked up and try to get the right sync pulses out of it. So let's look at the pinout over here. Um, the datasheet has an addition to this, it has a great description of what all the pins are for. Uh, but the ones we're going to need first fall into a few categories. First of all we have the usual kind of bus control pins with a read, a chip select and a write signal here, which is much like the way, the way RAM works. Um, and we have these uh, three address lines here, A0, A1 and A2, which allow us to select uh, one of up to eight kind of uh, register ports on, on, the, on the controller. And we have eight data lines over here as well to, to send data in and out of it. So that's a very standard kind of arrangement, uh, just, like for, just like for the kind of RAM chips we're using as well. So secondly, there's a character clock pin over here called C clock. Um, and this controls the rate at which characters are kind of output on the display. It's the fundamental timing metric that the, that the chip uses for all of the sync timings and things like that. And like I said before, maximum frequency for this is 4 MHz. We're going to use about 3.1. We're going to divide 25.175 by 8. And finally, there are the sync outputs. There's a horizontal sync um, a combined vertical and composite sync pin here, um, and a blank pin, which might also be useful as well. Um, and these are the main kind of outputs that we're going to be looking for in this kind of first trial of, try of using the of using the chip. And I believe the sync outputs here are active low, which matches the required polarity for 640 by 480 VGA. If that's not the case, then I'll need to put inverters in. There's also a nice block diagram of the uh, whole device here, um, and you can see over here the bus uh, control inputs uh, to this interface block. Uh, the data lines come in here, uh, the address uh, lines also come into that interface block, um, and that's mostly going to uh, set registers in this control block uh, from the values that we're going to pass in on the data bus. Down at the bottom, uh, you can see the clock input that we're also going to be providing. Um, and they've just kind of drawn the timing circuitry down here. And you can see that the sync pulses and blank output come out of there as well. And the remaining components on the right hand side here aren't going to be relevant at first, but uh, we have this display module here, um, which uh, outputs the video memory addresses that it's counting over, um, and a cursor indication, which I guess tells you t tells t tells your display circuit whether the current character cell contains the cursor or not. Um, and at the top here uh, is the bus interfacing that it referred to, the way it can help out with your CPU sharing access to video memory in various ways, and these signals can be used for that. So to get things started, I'm going to wire a 25.175 MHz VGA oscillator with a fast counter to divide it down eight times to get the character clock that I want, um, which is a little over three megahertz. And I'm going to wire that through to the character clock input on the 2674. I'm also going to wire the V-Sync and H-Sync signals from the 2674 to a VGA connector. And for now I'm going to also join the red, green and blue signals together on the VGA connector and wire them to ground. 
So we're not expecting to see any image yet. Initially I'm just hoping to get a good sync signal. And according to the datasheet, the IC starts up in a disabled mode. And to enable it and configure it, we need to set some register values. So I'm going to wire the data and address pins to the 6502 circuit. And I'll also need to wire the bus control pins, of course. The datasheet quotes timings for these, and unfortunately the fastest speed supported by this chip is only a few megahertz, which is a little bit slow. My, my 6502 here is running at 6 megahertz, and that's too fast. So rather than connecting it straight to the 6502's buses, as you probably normally would, I'm actually just going to connect it through the 6522, uh, which will allow me to communicate with it at a slower speed. I'm also only going to support writes for now, um, so I'm going to write wire read high uh, and chip select uh, low, and I'm going to be toggling the write pin to actually cause writes to happen, so write will go through to the 6522. So now we need to sort out how to actually write to the registers. According, according to table 1 up here, if I set all three of the address pins low um, and I attempt to write, uh, it's going to write initialization registers. And also if I set the first two address lines low and A0 high, uh, then write it's going to write to the command register. And those are the two things that I'm going to need in order to get the chip up and running, I believe. So the footnote here is interesting. It says that there are actually 15 initialization registers, um, but there's obviously only one kind of address provided here. Um, and every time you write something to one of the initialization registers, it advances an internal pointer, so the next write will go to the next register. So in order to initialize all of them, all I have to do is write 15 values to that same address, one after another, and it will initialize all the registers in sequence. So. The functioning of the initialization registers is documented here then, and uh, you can see that it's just going to count through them. So let's figure out what we want to set each of these registers to, to get a VGA compatible signal out. So first we have initialization register 0, uh, whose high bit controls the double height and width enable, which is really only relevant for text modes, which isn't what I'm going to be doing. Um, so we won't use it and can set it to 0. Then next we set the number of scan lines per character row. Now we're going to be using the non-interlaced mode. So as I hinted before, I'm going to set this to four scan lines per character row. Um, and according to this list here, we need to actually program in a value one less. You can see here that zero means one line, one means two lines. So three is going to mean four lines. So we're going to, let, let's just write the numbers in here. We're going to pass a zero for that first bit and then we're going to pass zero zero one one for these bits here. Then we choose the vertical uh, or composite sync output from pin 18. So composite sync is used in some video configurations such as composite, component, uh, SCART and S-Video but it's not used for VGA. VGA has separate horizontal and vertical syncs so I'm going to set this to zero to choose vertical sync rather than composite sync. And then finally for this initialization register we have a buffer mode select choice. Um, and these correspond to different ways in which the CPU uh, can coordinate access to video memory. And I'm just going to use independent mode initially, so that's 0, 0 there. Next, the high bit of initialization register 1 controls interlacing, which we're going to want to disable. So that's a 0. Then the lower seven bits define an equalizing constant. Uh, and the datasheet elsewhere has a bit more information about how to calculate this. Uh, the formula is also given here though, uh, and it says it indirectly controls the width of the horizontal front port. So for 640x480 VGA, the horizontal total is 800 pixels, but we need to give numbers in character clocks here, so that's only 100 character clocks uh, for this kind of sum here. Now we're going to divide that by 2 to get 50, and then we need to subtract two times the horizontal sync width. So the horizontal sync width is 12 character clocks, so two times that is 24 character clocks. We'll subtract that off and get 26. Um, and then, according to the table here, again, we need to subtract one again uh, to get the number we actually configure. So this number here is going to be uh, 25. So what's that? That's like 0, 0. One one, yes, and then zero zero one. 
there is a little problem here which we're going to have to deal with a little bit later. Um, the data sheet uh, says that the uh, minimum front porch is three character clocks, but for VGA it's meant to be just two character clocks at the clock frequency we're using. Um, we could perhaps just get away with this by reducing the back porch instead to keep things within spec. I'm not totally sure yet, but I need to remember to subtract uh, an extra character clock from somewhere um, to make this all add up, and I'll do that a bit later on. So on to initialization register 2. Um, the top bit is used to enable the row table, which we're not using yet. So I'm going to set that to 0. Then there were a few bits to define the horizontal sync width, which as I said is 12 character clocks for VGA. Um, what's the calculation here? I'll deal with that in a sec. The last three bits define the back porch width, which is six character clocks. So I'm going to round the back porch down to five uh, because only odd numbers are supported here. So these values then need to be uh, translated through these tables, um, and I, that's going to give me five for the first one and uh, two for the last one. Initialization register 3 starts with three bits defining the vertical front porch, which should be 10 for VGA. And then the bottom five bits define the vertical back porch, which should be 33. However, according to the data sheet, um, just looking at these tables, it looks like the front porch needs to be a multiple of four scan lines. And the back porch a multiple of two. So neither of those actually fit. Um, and looking ahead a little bit uh, to initialization register 7, the V-sync width also needs to be an odd number, whereas the standard number for 640 by 480 here would be 2. So I need to adjust all of these a bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the V-sync width to 3 scan lines, because I think bigger is probably better for that. Um, and then I'm going to increase the front porch from 10 scan lines to 12. And then I'm going to decrease the batch back, back porch from 33 scan lines to 30. So I'm just following a general principle of preferring to increase small things and decrease large things. And we'll have to just try it out and see whether that actually works. So the ultimate value I'm going to get out here um, after translating through these tables is going to be 0, 1, 0. Um, that's to choose 12 scan lines for the front porch. And then 0, 1, 1, 0, 1 uh, to get 30 scan lines for the back porch. Now, initialization register 4, the top bit here defines the blink rate of blinking characters. Um, not doing characters, so don't really care about that. And the remaining bit defines the number of character rows on the screen, um, which is going to be 120 for us. Uh, and again, we subtract 1, so this comes out as um, 119. So initialization register 5 defines the number of characters per row. So I think the value I'm going to have to use here is 79. I'm not totally sure. I remember I need to subtract one for the um, front port change. Um, so I'm going to go with 79. Um, We'll see how that goes. I don't know if it's going to work properly. Uh, then what have we got here? Initialization register 6 uh, looks like it's all related to the cursor, so I don't care about that. I'm just going to use 0 for that one. Um, initialization register 7, yeah, the v-sync width is important. So as I said before, I'm going to have to use three scan lines for the v-sync width instead of two scan lines as I ought to. Um, and this table's in a funny order, but that seems to be correct. The cursor blink I don't care about, the cursor rate I don't care about, and the underline position I also don't care about because those are all text mode only. So I looked ahead at these and I think the remaining registers are only important for um, things like hardware scrolling and th uh, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, split screens and things, double heights and scrolling again. So. We don't need to fill these in with anything, really, so I'm just going to leave those as zero.
So these are the values we need to program in, but first I apparently need to issue two master reset commands in a row. Commands are issued by writing to address 001, and master reset is all zeros according to the datasheet. So to send the command, I want to set the 6522's port A to bring the 2674's write pin low with A0 high, and then I want to set the data I want on port B, which is 0 in this case, and then I can set the write pin on port A high again to issue the command. I need to do that twice here to send two reset commands, uh, and then we can start sending the initialization register data. And this is going to follow the same process but with A0 low, um, and I'm going to do it inside a loop to keep things tidy rather than sending all of the values with separate bits of code. So after that's done then, we should start seeing valid sync signals, so let's give it a go and see what happens. I'm not going to connect a monitor straight away, I'm just going to use a multimeter first to check the sync frequencies are appropriate, and then maybe verify some things on the oscilloscope as well. And once, once everything looks good then I can try on a monitor. OK, so let's see what we've got here. I put the room in with the program on it, uh, everything's wired through to the VIA here now. Um, only one of the address lines wired through, the other two I can keep them low, that should be fine. Um, the power is on and I've got the meter ready in frequency monitoring mode. So turn on the power. And that says initialising and D for done. I should have put a new line in there but never mind. So that should have initialised everything, so let's have a look at what's happening over here. So first of all we should have a 25 megahertz signal from the crystal oscillator. Looks good. Um, and then the uh, signal that we're passing into the uh, SCN2, whatever it was, 2674, uh, that should be at 3 megahertz, slightly over 3 megahertz. Oh hang on, we've got that twice as fast as it should be. Oops, put it in the wrong pin. Okay, let's move that along. I should have checked the pin out more carefully on the uh, timer I see here. I think um, I got the wrong one there. Let's try that again. So again, we've got initialising and done, and the clock input to the video chip is now 3.146 megahertz, which is great, that's exactly what we wanted. So, um, hopefully now we're getting sensible frequencies on the sinks, so let's have a look at that. We've got 31.46 kilohertz, uh, that'll be the horizontal sink, so that's perfect, that's exactly what it should be. And the vertical one... Yeah, I can't read the vertical one with this meter because the duty cycle is too short for the vertical sync. Um, it only dips down very briefly, and yeah, the meter I don't think can read that. But yeah, that's really promising. Let's have a look on an oscilloscope and see if we can see the vertical sync as well. So, as is often the case when I make something like this, I'd made a mistake, and it took quite a while to track it down, so let's talk through that. What you can see here in yellow is the main VGA clock at 25.175 MHz. Next I'm hooking up blue to the divided clock that runs at about 3.1 MHz and feeds into the video processor, and I'm setting it to trigger on blue instead of yellow, so those signals look fine if rather noisy. And now I'm reconnecting the yellow probe to the vertical sync and getting nothing. So I'll try the horizontal sync instead and that works. Um, changing the trigger again makes that more obvious, and we can see a nice wide horizontal sync pulse. It's 12 carat clocks wide, which is what we wanted, and the frequency seems to be pretty much bang on what it's meant to be. So next I connected the blue probe to vertical sync and zoomed out, but I'm still getting nothing there. 
and at this stage I started to wonder whether the IC was broken, or whether I'd missed a command I needed to issue to cause the vertical syncs to start, um, like a command to wake the monitor up from sleep mode for example. Um, however, I'd expect horizontal syncs to stop as well if the monitor was meant to be in, sync, in sleep mode. So I swapped the blue probe to the blank output from the video processor, and I found that that was high all the time, which means that the video processor is asking that the display be blanked. And this was another indication that it could be trying to put the monitor to sleep, I thought. So I read the datasheet and found that there is a display on command, and that after initialization it will hold blank high until it receives that command. However, it also said that in the meantime it will send valid um, horizontal and vertical sync pulses. So that wasn't entirely what was wrong, it doesn't really explain why the V-Syncs aren't working. I also probed some of the address lines here and found that they were counting up as expected, uh, but not all the way. The last three address lines on the IC were all coming out zero. Again, looking at the datasheet in more detail, I found that initialization register 9 defines a uh, display end address um, and because I just set that to zero, the addresses were all wrapping after 4k, which explains why the last three address lines were all low. So next I updated the code to change the display end address, and added the display on command at the end of the program. And I also checked the calculations for the initialization registers and made sure I'd typed them in correctly. And I experimented with changes to the vertical timings to see if it was just some issue with the particular numbers I had used. So this wouldn't generate a VGA compatible signal if I changed these timings, but I can still do that to help me diagnose the problem. None of these made a substantial difference though, except that it was now counting up over the entire address range as expected. So finally, I set the probes up to probe the horizontal and vertical sinks again, and tried applying the vsync probe directly to the IC pin, and then I also tried pushing the IC into the breadboard with my finger in case there was a bad connection, and all of a sudden it started working, but only while I pressed on the chip. Of course, this is nothing to do with physical pressure, it's electrical noise caused by my hand being near the chip, and that's a sure sign that you've not connected an input pin somewhere and it's floating randomly. Referring back to the datasheet again then, the only pins I didn't connect were the address outputs, the hand checking control lines for managing CPU bus access to the memory, uh, the IRQ output that should go to the CPU, and the ACLL pin, which stands for AC line lock. Now while I thought it was potentially possible for the hand checking to cause the display to remain blank all the time, it shouldn't happen in the independent mode that I've selected here. And as soon as I saw the phrase AC line lock, it all made sense anyway. So AC Line Lock allows you to synchronize one analog video stream with another, which used to be necessary in broadcast scenarios when you wanted to overlay one thing on another, like subtitles and things like that. All you do is you have one video source listen to the sync data from the other one and match its vertical sync positions. Then for any pixel on the screen, you can pick and choose which of the two sources you read it from, or even blend between them, uh, just using simple analog circuits. So I knew that the video processor had this feature, but I'd assumed it was something that I'd need to activate in a register. However, it's not, it's on all the time, and the datasheet says that if you're not using the feature, you must wire ACLL high. So I went ahead and did that, and then, of course, all the vertical sync pulses started working. Here's a nice shot of the vertical sync lasting for three scan lines as configured. For further testing, next I hooked the red probe up to the blank output, which indicates when the display should be blanked. You can see here that it's high at the moment, and when I zoom out you can see it going low during each active scan line, and popping high again around each horizontal sync, um, and staying high for a long time around the vertical sync. I can also set the uh, oscilloscope to trigger on the blank signal to get a better look at the horizontal timings, and it flickers from time to time, as sometimes it's triggering on the vertical blank rather than the horizontal blank, uh, but it's enough for us to be able to see what the timings are like. And we have about 300 nanoseconds here for the front porch, which is about half of what it should be. And the back porch here is about two and a half microseconds, uh, which is longer than it's meant to be by about 600 nanoseconds. So a few things are wrong here. Firstly, I misunderstood the constraints on the back porch, as you can see in this shot from earlier in the video. The value I programmed in corresponds to seven clocks, not five as I intended. So this is stealing two of the clocks that ought to be going to the front porch. 
Secondly, when I programmed the number of active characters per row, although I tried to subtract one to make the front porch bigger, I actually needed to subtract one again due to the fact that, as is often the case for this IC, the value to program in is one less than the actual number of clocks that you want to use, so in the end I was not gifting the extra character to the front porch that I'd intended. So, this all started out with me wanting to see whether this IC was capable of VGA timings, and as quickly became obvious from working out the register values, the answer is kind of. It is able to produce a signal that my monitor recognises as 640 by 480 60Hz VGA, but it's not possible to get the timings exactly to spec. Both sets of porches and the vertical sync duration have to be rounded to values that differ from the official timings. Anyway, the other point of this exercise was just to have fun figuring out how to use a monolithic IC that I'd not used before, and going through the challenge of reading the data sheets, working out how it operates, what register values to set, and so on. So, although it didn't work first time, it was due to a stupid wiring error, um, and I'm pleased that everything I worked out in advance from the data sheet was actually pretty much correct. I don't know whether I'll actually use this IC for anything substantial, but one day I might go back and look at the memory interfacing and make it actually generate an image. I already have a pretty good grasp of how the different bus modes operate, and on the whole they're going to perform worse than the kind of thing I'm doing in my own circuits, um, but some of them are easier to configure. The independent mode, for example, doesn't need any additional connections from the CPU to the video RAM, it all goes through the um, this chip itself. So there's potentially a great convenience factor there. So thanks for sticking with me through this, as it's quite a bit longer than usual. And do let me know if you're interested in more info on this IC, or if you can dig up any other obscure ICs from past decades that it might be interesting to figure out how to use. See you next time.